7. We are diving a little bit deeper into the story each and every week. And if you've not been with us, you know that we are in a series on the, or you might not know that we are in a series on the book of Revelation. And so we come to chapter 7 this week. If you've not had a chance to be with us or if you've missed a week or two, let me encourage you to do um, your best to go online and listen to or watch those sermons. I think it'll really benefit you if you can kind of keep up along the way. And you can do that on our website. Uh, But each week, I will do my best to bring everybody up to speed. So uh, let's do that together this morning and kind of uh, walk through where we've been so far. Now, this is nearly impossible to do because the story has been so deep and complex, uh, but I'll do my best to cover where we've been uh, so far. Again, from the 30,000-foot viewpoint, John is exiled on this island called Patmos. It's basically a Roman prison island. It's a rugged, rocky place. And there he is, prevented from being with the community that he loves, the church in Ephesus where he's been serving as an elder. Now, life for Christians is not easy in the first century, and we've been talking about this. In fact, the world around them uh, has developed this worship um, system of Roman gods, and the emperor himself is in fact worship, worshipped in uh, the world in which these first century Christians live. And in fact, the very social fabric of first century life revolved around these festivities that had to do with Roman god worship and emperor worship, and everybody was expected to join in. Now, the Christians we're not joining in. In fact, they were very much countercultural in this day. They were confessing not Caesar is Lord, not the Roman gods are Lord, but they are confessing that Jesus is Lord. Very countercultural again in that day and time. But if you were looking in from the outside and you were watching everything that was going on in the first century, you might not think that Jesus is Lord because it seems like The Romans are in charge. And so John, exiled on this island, is able to peek into this other realm, this other dimension. And here he sees what we cannot see. And he's told, as Jesus visits him, as an angel communicates to him, John, write down what you see. So he does. And as he writes, he is recording what he sees. And and as he does this... He's writing this down in a particular way and in a particular genre that you and I don't have a lot of experience reading. It's called the apocalyptic genre. And as we read it, sometimes it seems weird, it seems strange, and we have a hard time wrapping our minds around it. But again, the features of apocalyptic genre or apocalyptic literature include symbols and imagery and oftentimes when we read this, again, we, we kind of push back and we say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. But again, we need to be careful not to try to read it literally, but to read it symbolically. And when we do that, we begin to understand what John is communicating to us because the symbols are powerful. So what has John seen so far? Let's just kind of walk through this together. In the first chapter, John encounters Jesus in all of his glory. Look at this verse from Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Jesus says to John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus appears to him. Jesus assures him, I'm from the beginning to the end. I'm holding the keys of death and Hades in my hand. And in the second and third chapters, we read John's word to the seven churches. And then in chapters four and five, we walk with John into the very throne room of God. Now, this narrative includes all sorts of strange creatures, 24 elders surrounding the throne of God, that they're looking for one who is worthy to open a scroll. And you might say, well, what's the scroll all about? What's going on there? Now, the scroll is God's book, is God's plan. And we talked about the fact that it's mentioned in the Old Testament over and over again. And so you've got this sealed scroll, and it doesn't seem like anybody's worthy. But then there is one 
who is worthy. It's not the one that you think would be worthy. It's not a warrior. It's not the lion. But it is a lamb. A lamb looking as if he had been slain. And he begins to open this scroll. Now last week, if you were with us, you know that the scroll was not lots of wonderful, beautiful things. In fact, it reveals all sorts of evil in our world. Do you remember that? The four horsemen coming, four different colors of horses. And each one reveals a particular evil going on in our world. And we talked about the fact that these four horsemen are not just talking about something that's going to happen one day, but really they represent evil in every generation. And we talked about them last week. And then as we ended, or as we got toward the end of chapter 6, we find those who have been killed for Jesus, the martyrs, and they're standing there in white robes, and they're told to wait And then the the sixth seal was this great earthquake and turmoil that kind of inhabits the the earth. And and peek with me at the very end of chapter 6. Look at these verses. I'm going to read the last verses of chapter 6. And they kind of help us as we step in to chapter 7 together. It says this. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? Again, not a touchy-feely sort of way to leave on a Sunday, is it? Not one of those sermons that you come to church and you're like, oh, we're getting all pumped up now about what it means to serve God. It's very scary and dark here in chapter 6. But like the prophecies of old, the day when God comes, it will be a terrible day for some, but for others it will be a wonderful day. And that's where we find ourselves in chapter 6. Seven. So with all of this in mind, let's continue in the story. We're going to read in two parts this morning. Andy Heimlich, I believe, is going to come and read for us. And let me invite you to look at verses 1 through 8. We're going to read that part first, and we're going to talk about it, and we're going to come back and read the rest of the chapter together. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Judah, Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. All right. Now, back in June, uh, we spent a few days, our family did, in New England. And we decided to hike up uh, one of the mountains in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And I'm not sure if you've ever been... Uh, over there, but it's a little bit different than Indiana, a little steeper. And we measured out the distance of our hike, and we thought, you know, this is a two or three hour hike. And as we began to make the hike, we realized that we weren't going to get done in two to three hours. In fact, it turned into a six hour hike. And so we climbed that very rocky, steep trail up to the top of Mount Lafayette. And there were times that I thought, we're never going to reach the top. Maybe that's how you feel in terms of revelation as we've been walking through this together. Are we ever going to get there? Is God ever going to turn things around? Is this ever going 
to end. I, I felt last week as we were going through chapter 6, it was like climbing a mountain. It was painful, wasn't it? As we walked through this story together and we saw all of the evil in the world, uh, we kept thinking, is it ever going to get better? Is God ever going to come through? This morning, what we see is quite different from what we saw last week. Look at verse 1. After this, again, how many seals have been opened? Six seals. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or in the sea or on any tree. Now, what, what's all this about? Now, remember, we're reading apocalyptic literature, right? In the apocalyptic genre. So it's different. And so we have to understand the, the terminology and the symbols that are going on here. And in apocalyptic thought, the forces of nature are under the charge of angels. And so we might also mention that the world in the ancient world was often seen as having four corners. Now it's not to say that the earth is flat as some would have us believe today. It's to say, that's just the way the ancients thought about the world, right? They understood it as having four corners. And so, destruction is coming. And so, you've got these angels who are holding back the destruction. Look at verse 2. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Now, what's this about? What's the seal of the living God? Seals were used in, in the ancient world to uh, enclose documents, to keep prying eyes. But seals were also used as a means of identification, of kind of marking a document as being from this person or that person. I used to have a stamp in my desk, and I, I don't have it anymore, I'm not sure what happened to it, but I would get a book, and I would take this stamp out of my desk, and I would always stamp the book when I purchased it, and it would say, from the library of Wade Allen. And that way, if I loaned the book out, you would know to return it to me. And so if you have a book at your house and it says that, you can bring it back. It's a mark. I marked the book, and I said, this is my book. That's what a seal is. That's what the seal of the living God. It's not a seal as in, in terms of, of closing it up. It's a seal in terms of identification. God is marking those who are his. That's the kind of seal we're saying. And he says in verse 3, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal, a mark, on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now God wants... To mark his people. He's telling the angels, look, you guys hold back. The destruction is coming. These four corners of the earth, the angels are holding back these forces. And God says, wait a minute, stop, pause. I need to mark my people. Now this sounds a lot like the Exodus story, doesn't it? Do you remember that story? When the people of God were in houses and God said the angel of death is going to come, right? Right? And what did the people do? They took the blood of a lamb and they painted their doorpost. They marked their houses. And so then when the angel of death came by, he passed over. And that's what the Passover is all about. Sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? And then in verse 4 we read, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Now we hear this number and we know that some have taken this number to be a literal number. There are some groups of, of Christians, some groups of believers who believe that's 144,000, that's, that's the amount of people, literally. But we know, as we've been reading the book of Revelation, that numbers in apocalyptic literature are most often symbols, aren't they? And so think about this for a moment. How many tribes of Israel do we have? Twelve? How many people in each tribe are we talking about? 12,000, right? So 12 times 12,000 is, or sorry, 12 times 12 times 1,000. So 12 times 12,000, 144,000. Again, this number is a symbolic number that represents the complete people of God, those who will be sealed. Now, 
As we read this list of tribes, I just want to show you here, it's worth noting a few unique features about the list here because I'm, I'm afraid that some of you will email me later and ask me about this. So I want to cover this this morning. But first of all, you might notice that the first tribe that is mentioned is Judah. Now, Reuben is the elder tribe and is usually listed first, but here in this list we have Judah listed first. Why would that be, do you think? who's from the tribe of Judah, who is the lion of Judah, right? Jesus. And so Jesus' tribe is mentioned first. And you also might notice that the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. And it's worth noting that in Jewish tradition, the Antichrist was going to come from the tribe of Dan. So that tribe is not mentioned. Instead, we have the tribe of Manasseh, which you might see as Joseph in some translations. He's one of Joseph's children. And so Manasseh is replacing Dan, but we still have 12 tribes. So I just wanted to mention that in case you were wondering. Now, before we read the rest of the chapter, let, let's pause for a moment here and let's talk about what this is all about. Why is this story inserted between si seal 6 and seal 7? We're, we're moving along, we get six seals, we think, okay, let's open the seventh seal, and then we have this pause here. It seems that before evil is unleashed, and let me warn you, next week is going to be crazy in terms of what we see, what we read. And again, I'll, I'll send you an email this week and you could read through that passage and you might be going, what is going on here? Right? It's kind of crazy. So the seventh seal has got some crazy stuff in it. But we have this pause here in, in terms of between six and seven. And it seems that God wants to mark his people before these terrifying events happen. God is protecting his children. Now let's keep reading. Let's just take in the imagery of this chapter. I'm going to invite Andy to come back and read verses 9 through 17 here. Follow along with me and then we'll come back and talk about this in just a moment. Revelation 7 verses 9 through 17. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. All right, thank you, Andy. All right, you might notice that John heard, heard the number 144,000, but he sees something different, right? He sees a great multitude. He sees an unlimited number. Look at verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. And look, he says, that no one could count. Just in case we were taking that 144,000 literally, John says, look, I saw so many. I heard 144,000, this symbolic number, but when I looked, I saw more than you could count. And it included people from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. What a beautiful picture, isn't it? How many? Too many to count. They represent every tribe and nation. They're clothed in white representing victory and purity. We see these white robes over and over again. And they're carrying palm branches. Palm branches are another symbol of victory. 
And they can't keep quiet. What are they saying in verse 10? They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Who's in charge? God's in charge. Who's on the throne? He, God, God sits on the throne and the Lamb is on the throne. The, the, the Greek word for salvation in verse 10 literally means to rescue. And so the rest of the chapter brings us back into the throne room of God and we see angels and elders and four creatures. All these images that we've seen before. Look at verse 11. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. God, John is in the throne room and he's watching as all of this unfolds. He records their praise. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Who's in charge? God's in charge. Are the Romans in charge? No. It looks like they're in charge to all the Christians living in the first century. I mean, the Romans are beating them up. The Romans are persecuting them. The Romans are making life miserable for the Christians. But yet, God is the one who is in charge. And as John gets this glimpse here, before the seventh seal is opened, he sees God on the throne, deserving all glory and power and wisdom and honor and strength. The one... Then one of the elders speaks up and asks a question. Look at verse 13 with me. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? Now, the first readers of this revelation needed the answer, right? The elder then answers his own question. I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. Other translations say suffering there. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They've come out, they've come out of great suffering. They've lived through the nightmare. Their clothes, though, are white. And it's not because they have perfect lives. Their, their holiness and purity is because of what? The blood of the Lamb. As we think about the churches in the first century who would have heard these words for the first time they might be thinking we're suffering we're enduring persecution but here see and understand God's provision and protection for his people well we see suffering people and now they're dressed in white robes and they're praising God for all that God has done and we might be asking more specific questions as we read this chapter we might be saying well when is this going to happen are we in the crowd? Or are we there wearing white robes, carrying palm branches? You see, often in apocalyptic literature, we have descriptions that are outside or beyond time and space. And often in apocalyptic literature, you see the past and the present and the future all fused together in one image. And the point here is that God's people, those in the first century who were suffering, and you and me and the saints of old, will be protected. They will be rescued. They will be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And, and so the last few verses of this chapter give us a glimpse into this other dimension, this other realm, where God's people are rescued from their suffering. Look at verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is at the center of the throne, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The language that John uses here evokes memories of God's people worshiping in the Old Testament. I want to put this verse on the screen because I want you to see it. These are Isaiah's words, written hundreds of years before John pens this. And these are words where Isaiah describes the people of God returning 
from Babylonian exile. What does he say? They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. It sounds a lot like what John is saying here, doesn't it? A lot like this description. It's a beautiful description of God rescuing His people, providing for those who are His. Now, interpreters often debate these chapters and they, they want to place it in a timeline. But let me encourage you to read these passages as you might view a piece of art. You don't try to break down every brush stroke and try to figure out exactly what the artist was doing and when this stroke was painted and what, the, what the, the texture and the tone of this particular stroke would be. In fact, if you do that, you might lose the piece of art in the process. Well, one scholar puts it this way, and I, I like the way he writes this. The apocalypse, or the revelation, is the work of a creative artist and must not be pressed into a clearly defined plan. I think we have to be careful not to try to press it too hard and try to say, well, this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and this is going to play out exactly at, at this time or on this timeline. Because if you read interpretations, you will read literally hundreds of interpretations. And people have an idea about this and they think that this matches up with this particular part of history and this over here matches up with this part of history. And I think it's better just to back away from that and to sit back and to enjoy this image of God's redeemed people. Some of the language is symbolic and it doesn't need to be explained in terms of pointing to particular features. The bottom line is this. Suffering is over, and the people of God are rescued, and now in the presence of God. The Lamb is at the center, leading the great people of God into springs of living water. Another great image that's used over and over in Scriptures. Tears wiped away. Now, next week, we're going to get into chapter 8 together. And let me warn you, it's going to be some weird stuff. And you're going to wonder, what in the world is going on here? But don't forget chapter 7. Because God is marking his people before this, all of this stuff happens. Now we're going to stop here today at the end of chapter 7. But I want to ask the question before we leave this morning. What does this mean for us? What do we do with Revelation chapter 7 in 2019? What application does it have for you and me? Now, if we back away from the details and we do our best to simply take in John's vision, we can celebrate. We can celebrate because God is going to come and make things right. And given the magnitude of evil in our world today, it doesn't take long, does it, to look around our world and to say, man, where's our world going? Where's God in the midst of all of the turmoil in our world. We talked about this last week. And we realize that as God is coming in to make all things right, as, as He is making the world right again, it's going to require blowing away the evil in the world. And that's what this wind, these winds are going to be destructive winds. But they're God making things right. But before God does this, before the evil comes, He takes His people and he marks them. He says, these are my people. They will not be destroyed. Rescue is for them. Salvation is for them. How many are there? There are more that can be counted. From every tribe and nation and people. And again, they're wearing white robes. Symbolizing purity and holiness. God has taken the people of God. And this image of the people of God. When's it going to happen? It's going to happen. Are we going to be in the group? Sure, we're going to be in the group because it's all people throughout all of history who have been redeemed. And, and their purity, their white robes, is not because they've lived perfect lives. It's because the blood of the Lamb has covered them. They've been washed with the blood of the Lamb. What a beautiful image. The rescued people of God praising Him. Before the throne, worshiping Him. This, this image, this picture of what God is doing for His people is a beautiful picture. And you and I can rest assured that if we trust 
in the blood of Jesus, if we've been covered by the blood of Jesus, that we are part of this group. It might seem like the world is falling apart sometimes. It might seem like evil is winning. But God is a saving God. God is a rescuing God who has done this over and over again. And we, have, we again have these different images of rescue throughout Scripture, don't we? If we take the whole story, the whole narrative from creation to revelation, we see the, these these. Motifs of salvation. Ex- the Exodus is one of them. We'll go back to Noah. Noah and the, the ark is one of them. The, the Exodus is one of them. And over and over, God's people are saved. They're brought out of exile. And Jesus comes. And once and for all, His blood is what saves us. We trust in the blood of Jesus. And we are rescued. This morning, it's an appropriate time to come together to the table. And we don't always gather in a combined service like we're doing this morning. But it's great that we can come to the table as one church body this morning. And we're confessing this morning that the blood of Jesus covers our sin. When we receive communion, when we take communion... What we're doing is we're confessing that his body was broken for me. And we take a piece of bread and we place it in our mouth. And we're saying it was his body that's broken for me. And we take a small cup of grape juice in our case. And we place it in our mouth. And we confess his blood was shed for me. We are saying we are nourished through the body and the blood of Jesus. And as we do that this morning, if you are a follower of Christ, if you could say... His blood was shed for me. His body was broken for me. You're invited to come. And this morning we're going to to gather down front and just have you come as God would lead you and receive communion. If you'd like to take the elements over to the side and pause for just a moment and consume them there, you do that. If you'd like to consume it right when you take it, you do that. But you, you take the body and blood of Jesus, you consume it, and you pray and confess and celebrate his rescue in your life. Paul tells us that as we come to the table, that we need to examine our lives. We need to take just a moment. And so as the elements are brought in this morning, let me invite you to bow your head and to pray and to confess and to examine.